Welcome to Dark Sound, Oil, Ecology, Sound and Loss, with Mikkel Arnieto. Mikkel is an artist, independent researcher and writer from San Sebastian. His work focuses on the socio-cultural and political aspects of the act of listening and foregrounds field recording as a means towards a radical and critical practice of phonography. This event was organised by Praxis in collaboration with sound artist Lasse Mark Rieck, the Goethe Institute Norway, Grün Recorder and Nosh Technis Museum. It took place in September 2020 alongside both Praxis' 17th residency, which is titled Climata, Capturing Change at a Time of Ecological Crisis, and the exhibition Klima 2 Plus, held at Technis Museum. Um, thank you, Nicolas. Uh, thanks to everybody. Um, I don't know if you can hear me well. Yeah, that's nice. So I'm really glad to be here and uh, I'm really happy to see some familiar faces, but I would like to see all the faces. I mean, if you don't mind, and it's like a really funny still for me to, to be alone at home and, uh, and, and to see a lot of people just in front of me, you know, and to, to talk with them. That's nice to see a lot of people from different places also. Thanks for coming and, and, and for coming to, to listen to this project, which is uh, not only mine, there are many people involved. And uh, yeah, and we will talk today about Dark Sound, which is a, uh, a book, dark book, obviously. I don't know if some people uh, know that book already, but uh, I mean, uh, I will propose to you, I mean, today I will try to make a, like a kind of experiment, like a, try to not to read the, 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 the same text that is in the book. So when I received the, the email from, from Nicolas, uh, I just thought like uh, maybe I can, I can open the, that folder that it was uh, full of text, uh, unpublished text, which is they are not in the book because as mass I understood the proposal is uh, more focusing to the oil and in that book, the published book is, is more focusing to the listening. What is happening in, when we listen to the other? Doesn't matter if it's an, uh, an, another person or is inside us or if it's a stone, doesn't matter. So I just, I mean, I was working this week uh, with this text that we will have a look. I have two texts and one introduction, but I will I will ask for help because sometimes I'm really tired of myself and, and my voice. I don't know if it's happening to you sometimes, but for me it's happening, especially when I'm writing and you know, when I spend alone a little bit with ideas, crazy ideas, and I, and I can see some relationships between them, sometimes I get bored. So I will ask to someone who, who can help me out to read a text after. I don't know if there is a volunteer, uh, maybe someone who can uh, have a perfect pronunciation of English, not like me, you know? <laughs> Otherwise we will have fun uh, with, my with my pronunciation of, of my bad English with the text. So uh, is there any volunteer to, to read that text with me? That's nice, Sarah. <laughs> Thank you. I will I will tell you when we will start. So I don't know if everyone is ready. I will share with you like a presentation that you will find online. Um, you can you can find it here. Okay, let me share with you. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay. Good. So I just made like a uh, this presentation just for you. Um, so today we will, as I said before, we will, we will, we will talk about this publication that we made in 2016 and we published in Gruen Recorder. Lasse is also in the room. Thank you, Lasse, for the invitation and, and the support. And, uh, so that book, it was, I mean, let's say, I mean, is as you can see, is, is, is a book, but for me it was, uh, it's, it's, it's more than a book. It's, it's just a tool, a tool like a, to think about different, different, different issues, different subjects, uh, such as oil, uh, listening, and radical otherness. Let's say 
So, I mean, that book, it was printed black on black. So it's a little bit difficult, as you can see here, to read. That's the proposal, you know, of the book, like uh, uh, for the reader, you know, it's not easy to read that, that text, but it was not easy to do it. It was not easy, I mean, to do the research in the Amazon rainforest. But uh, even the subject about, I mean, the three communities that they are living there in the Ecuadorian, uh, in the Ecuadorian part of the Amazon rainforest in the Yasuni Natural Park, I mean, it's not easy for them also the situation that they are dealing with since the beginning of the time. So I thought maybe it could be a great idea like a, to print it like a black and black and, and, and to continue that difficulties even in, in the final part of the publication. Anyway, uh, during the process, we, we thought like, a, um, like a, it could be also uh, a good idea to establish the price as you can find it here. The price of this book is set by the crude of oil brand price. So uh, we propose, I mean, uh, to the buyers to, to, to buy the, the book, as you can see here, the price is going down and going up, uh, mostly it's going up uh, like uh, the oil is doing all the time. So today, this is the price and every day, you know, it's changing the price. So it was like a, just another idea to, to, to make this tool useful for different kind of approaches uh, to the same issues. In any case, what, I will, what I'm trying to do is like a, to call to a, I don't know if it's, we can call it a responsibility, but a kind of awareness, you know. Uh, this is why in the book also, it, uh, it says like uh, by buying this book, you are contributing to the destruction of the planet. It's obvious that when we are uh, printing books, you know, we are uh, using papers, ink, doesn't matter if it's oil, I mean, everything to make them possible. Uh, even if we send an email, as uh, Nicolas is, is putting in, in, in his, his mails, you know, uh, is, is reminding us like uh, everything has its own traces. And I'm more focusing to find those traces and, and to think about them. Anyway, um, let's, let's, let's start maybe with this little video that I use like a, as a kind of joke. Uh, to think about, uh, let's say, from the I, the idea of the self and the other, you know. Uh, mm, let's, let's, let's have a look to the little video and then we will come back to, to this presentation. We're not going to make it, are we? People, I mean. It's in your nature to destroy yourselves. Yeah. Major drag, huh? Okay, this video, as you can see, is uh, from this movie, which is called Terminator 2. I mean, it's a kind of joke, but uh, this part is really good because if we understand, I mean, uh, that Terminator, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger as a kind of non human, what we can call as a non human, you know, and uh, humans kids, we will understand a little bit that uh, a little bit of our sense as we can see now when we are facing the, the, the sixth extinction, let's say. So it's, it's really sort that it was a kind of joke just to don't waste anything in this project. Uh, so all the waste that we found uh, during the process, uh, we use it with this beautiful sentence, you know, just to remind us like a you know, which kind of nature and what is nature. So there is, I mean, we should, we should think about what is nature and this, this kind of concept. I mean, in this project, we will find it. Anyway, let's continue. Uh, uh, I would like to show you like, a, I mean, I would like to propose you like a kind of exercise, which is just like a, uh, find different uh, part of ourselves in three communities that they are living in the Amazon rainforest. So those are they, the Tagaeri, the Waorani, and the Tromenane. We will be talking about them all the time, but uh, let me show you a little bit the exercise that I would like to propose to you today, which is mostly based in, in these 
three little concepts from Jacques Lacan. I will try to read that with my uh, really bad English. The imaginary, the symbolic, and the real are the three main registers in the constitution of the seek established by Jacques Lacan. The order of the imaginary has its basis in the formation of the ego in the mirror stage, that's it, the identification in the mirror image self. Let's say that the imaginary could be the tagaeri, right? The symbolic is the linguistic dimension and is built on the basis of the three differences between the signifiers. It's also the space where the subject is socially articulated, is the subject society hinge, where the social rules, ideological evaluations, the formation of desire, identities, etc., appear. Let's say that the Waorani could be this one, you know, the symbolic, because of their contact with the or I mean with the Western culture. Doesn't matter if it was like a oil companies or white people, let's say. And the conscious, the discourse of the other, the big other, is a structure structure like a language and is at the same time the fill of the law that regulates desire the real is supposed to imaginary and is beyond the symbolic because it's outside of the language however it's a fundamental lack that articulates the symbolic space the real is sort that which resists any symbolization it's impossible because it cannot be integrated into symbolic order and its condition gives a traumatic and representative character the traumatic are let's say these real people they are still in contact they don't have any contact they didn't have any contact with with anybody let's say meanwhile they were orani they call themselves like a, they are like a children of the jaguar and they have contact i mean since the 50s and the 60s with the western world starting from the with the international is, I mean, like a, from the SEAL, I mean, they call it SEAL, it's like an international Christian non-profit organization. I mean, in fact, I mean, there are many funny things or many interesting things how they perceive the world. And this is what in, is really interesting for me in this book, like a, how they see each other and how we can see them and how they perceive us. So it's like a kind of game all the time, you know, especially in, in the listening you know, act. So, for example, for Waorani, it's like, uh, it's the same thing to hear than to listen and also to believe. It's for them, it's like, a, we can call it like a kind of panacoustical in, in Heidegger's world. Words, you know, it's like, a, I mean, let's don't forget also like a, this kind of ideas of panacosticus, of Hitcher, of pan panopticum, of Jeremy Bentham, you know. But in any case, when we are listening, we shouldn't forget that listening is not neutral, it's not objective, neither pure auditory experience, you know. So for us probably hearing, uh, we will understand that, I mean, that act of hearing as a sense of perception and listening, we should understand that as an uh, aesthetic perception. So mostly, in between them, we will find like a different kind of approach, approaches uh, to the, what we call like a sound, noise and listening. And uh, as, as you can see here, for example, here, this is the mark of the Waorani or the Tagaeri people. Uh, there are some people that they say that they are already dead. I mean, they are, there is not, there is no any Tagaeri anymore because uh, oil companies killed them in the uh, 90s, during the 90s. There are other people who said like a Taromane killed a kill them. In any case, the Waorani people, remember that, is, is the people who has contact with us, with the Western culture. But now they've changed. I mean, how they have changed during this, like a, let's say 50, 60 years, I mean, they have changed a lot. They have like a really bad, I mean, all the consequences uh, with that change, it was uh, really bad for them, for the culture and everything. So we will use like a, these three, I mean, communities, Tagaeri, Waorani and Turmenane, as a kind of understand ourselves. Let's say Waorani could be the ego, Tagaere could be the super yo, and Turmenane could be the noun, let's say the, 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 the unconsciousness. So today we will focus on Taramenane, which is not on the book. 
So, but I like them a lot because we don't know absolutely nothing from them. In fact, this is the only picture that we have, this one. Because usually the government, the Ecuadorian, I mean, also the oil companies, they're taking pictures from, from the air. You know, for them it's really violent, as you can imagine. Any case, uh, let, me, let me read that little text for you, I mean, about them. The Seal missionaries translate the word Taromenga on Guipo as hell, which is in truth is the land of Taromenane. That's funny because uh, the missionaries translate in all the Waurani language and they make many mistakes, but all the time they are like a, as we do usually uh, projecting themselves. So as you can see here is another example of that projection. The Taromenane literally are giant people who live at the end of the trail among them, the people of the way. We don't know so much about them, but from the new sporadic context, we do know that they are a separate Waurani group in the early 20th century, in the context of the violent conflicts of the Huacho era. Well, they went up the headwaters of the Yasuni and Tipotini rivers. The Taramenane are the last three workers in the jungle, the hypostasy of the Tyria. And in fact, the Dark Sound uh, project, the research, when I was there, uh, I, was, I was there, I mean, inside the Yasuni Natural Park in the Tipotini River. The Waorani regularly mentioned the Taramenane. His descriptions are so extraordinary, fantastic beings, and that in avid forest. According to the Waorani, they detest the noise of machines and motors and prefer to go to the same places that monkey and peccary escape. Their time, all their time is taken by maintaining the specular boundaries within which they manufacture and this continuous representation of time in the image of that space. They are the spirit of the forest, the genius Loki of the landscape. They are the unspeakable to Samuel Beckett. We know about the Tramanane from the oil workers. Little less is known. They have no history. They have always been there where knowledge requires existential pain. Let's remember that every contact with them is really dangerous. In fact, I mean, they obviously, they, they, they don't welcome any, any, any white people, any Western people. So it's really difficult to have any kind of work from them. No one has gotten the direct news from their mouth. So this is why I put this, this uh, quote from Wittgenstein. If a, if a lion could talk, we could not understand him. Probably it's going to be the same thing with them. Silence. We lose the wall in memory of those who have keep silent. The Taramenane are absolutely sil silence. To listen to them is to contain their absolute otherness. To see a Taramenane is to see ourselves facing the abyss of the serial. There are still songs to be sung beyond men. In a speaking situation, we listen to others to extend that we hear. What we listen is to what we listen to is coexistive with what we hear. The listener has no such opportunity. We are all the time open. He must sub submit to the direction of others. The day we see the truth and we cease to speak or to listen, is the day we, we begin to die. In fact, we may one day come to remember them, not so much for the number of victims as the magnitude of the silence. Silence and silences and silencing are in themselves acoustically violent and the threat of noise often are a vehicle for mobilizing extreme ordering that seeks or maps onto social or powerful mechanisms on control. Furthermore, silence is also about as a weapon of subjugation, the suffocation of the other's voice. Repression operated, operated as an injunction to silence and as missing to that there was nothing to say about such things, nothing to see and nothing to know. And this is how we forget usually and we are forgotten. Listening to ourselves as others listen to us is simply the reserve and counterpart of the kit of listening to others as they really are and how they would like to be. And this is the exercise that I, will, I would like to propose to you today. Non-human beings, like they could be, uh, appear all the time as they, as they are ghosts penetrating our wall or even the opposite. We can explain ineffable things about them. We can say that we cannot explain the ineffable. Here we are. Explaining it, secret, means not entirely indescribable or unknown. You know that it's a secret. So this is my proposal for today. And 
before to start that text with uh, Sara, I would like to show you the beginning of the story of why I started working with these uh, three communities. Mostly it was because they, were, they had like a, let's say, a problem between oil companies, obviously, but uh, especially because of the noise. Uh, and they start having problems between this community. Meanwhile, they had been living in the rainforest, you know, like uh, peacefully. So let me show you this video, which is an interview to this chief, Waurani. Uh, Ompore, called Ompore, who is already dead by the Taromenane, but before the, the Taromenane visit him in the rainforest to talk to him, to ask him for some, you know, exchange stuff, you know, and also to ask him to, to stop all the noise in the rainforest. Because uh, the Taromenane people, this big odor, they know that the Waurani people, they have contact with the white people, and that's the truth. So let's, let's have a look to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
so uh, I don't know if everybody understood everything. <laughs> it's really easy to get lost with names and, uh, you know, when they are talking, also they, how they talk, I mean, their language, I mean, how it sounds is amazing for me. It's like, just like music for my ear. But uh, I mean, it's really amazing how they, 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 they understand, you know, the space. Everything is uh, marked by events, you know, like uh, this happened there, you know, the other thing happened there like uh, many years ago or whatever. You know, but the story is about that. The story is about like uh, the oil companies are in between the ego and the unconsciousness, let's say, you know, the Waorani people and the Traumenani. So as you can see, that guy on the left is like a, we, call, we can call it the psychoanalysis, let's say, is like a, talking to the ego and uh, telling to the ego, like uh, maybe you can talk to the, you know, to your unconsciousness and trying to be peaceful because the peace is one of the tools that the, you know, religion and also the state they are using uh, with these communities to manage them. I mean, just to convince them with, I don't know, with different kind of stuff like uh, Coca-Colas and whatever. It's not only money, it's just Coca-Colas because they like it, like uh, to, to drill oil from the territories, you know. So they are losing everything in, from the peace, starting from the soul, you know, and through the bodies, they are losing everything. I mean, the situation is, is, quite, is quite symbolic in some, somehow. That video is quite a document uh, because after that, what happened, it was like a the Taromenane, after some time, they, they came back to kill him, to him and, and, and to his wife. So they killed them. So after that, what happened? After 10 years, usually it's like that. After 10 years, they are killing each other with uh, different communities between the Taromenane and Waorani because the Tagaeri, they disappeared already. So uh, the Taromenane came back, they killed them, and after that, the Waorani, they went with uh, weapons that the state and the old companies give it to them. Uh, there are some roads even in between these communities when they are killing each other, you know, so you cannot use weapons, you know, guns. So they came back to, to, to kill the mostly the Waorani. So just think about like, a, probably they still might be there, like, I don't know, like a 300 uh, Taromenane. So if you kill like a 30, it's a lot of people. I mean, we can call it ethnocide. So who is the responsible for that? The Waorani people or is the state on, or who is the responsible? The oil companies. So mostly that's the situation, that's the story about, you know? I don't know if, if you can understand that, but it's like, a, you know, let's say the Waorani people, the Romenane, which is mostly probably they're still like a 200 people and that's all. And the Waorani, the, the, bigger and bigger because they are not hunting mostly they are you know like uh, consumers like us you know so let's continue with the presentation we can we can come back to the to that idea after uh, here okay so this i mean the story is about that when 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 the waurani people went to you know to to, to make that vengeance to the Taromenane people and they kill like, a, I don't know, 30, 20 Taromenane, a big house, you know, uh, they kill everybody, even kids, except like a two little girls. They're still alive and they are now living with the Waorani people. You know, they usually do that, you know, between communities, you know, with kids. So uh, the last Taromenane alive uh, before to die, uh, he described, as you will read here, I mean, uh, yeah, those were the last words of the last Taromenane left at life in 2013, Massacre. These were his words. We don't know you. We, we are not your relatives, nor your descendants, not worse, still your friends. We are extraneous and can kill you because you are reducing our territory more and more which is why we have killed you. Now you are killing us, but it doesn't matter. The other group, which is bigger, will take care of killing you. They, they, there were the devil sounds. They, I mean, they call the motor that makes the noise the devil. So it's really funny because probably he didn't say that. 
I mean, the Guarani, I mean, the Termenapi people, they didn't have any kind of contact with Western civilization. So they don't have any idea of sky, of devil, of hell, of nothing like that. But the Guarani people, they are translating their ideas to us. Let's say it's like a, how the ego and the consciousness is working, you know, in between that, these kind of ideas. So um, mostly, I mean, there is a chapter in the book which is mostly about that in, in Dark Sun, but is in the book that we publish is about this, this, this situation. What is going on when we listen, you know, and uh, this kind of symbolic situation. But for today, as I said, I would like to, I would like to, Sarah, I don't know if you're ready here. I cannot see you. Uh, let's go to that text. We can have a look a little bit, okay? I don't know if Sarah is here or she went oh, yes. to have a coffee Sorry. or something. Sarah, I can, I can listen to you. That's nice. Okay. Beautiful voice. That's good. Thank you. Thanks for helping me out with this text. So how do you want to do it? Would you like to uh, to read like a, a little bit you, a little bit me, maybe each paragraph, each one, something like that, mm -hmm. on the notes also, we can do something like that, yeah? Yeah, sure. Okay, yeah. I, I will start maybe, um, or yeah, I will start and maybe you can read my footnotes just to make it more interesting and, you know, also I will read yours. So let's start. It seems that in nature... Nature is a child playing. That's nice. <laughs> That's perfect. That's perfect. The best policy is to be as conservative as possible. The conservation of nature through the creation of reserves area is located at the beginning of the 20th century, but has antecedents in Western concept of contemplation of nature, which acquired the category of cultural phenomenon in the 19th century as a response of the in industrialized society to the idyllic values of a simpler and more perfect rural and natural society. Subsequently, its expression in the arts of the Romantic period marks a way of looking at an understanding nature that becomes the heritage of a part of Western urban and bourgeois society. And that little by little is giving way to tourist process in its form and contemporary organization. Consequent, uh, consequently, these antecedents with the aesthetic and spiritual value given to the nature by the most cultured elites created what we today call landscape, which is actually a way of looking at the world from a bourgeois and romantic perspective of the environment. This gaze contains the condition of possibility, if not the necessity by de definition, of the destruction of the environment to generate the sufficient and necessary distance for the gaze to admire nature and frame it. In fact, the first written reference to the delight and pleasure that nature grants, understood, understood as landscape, dates back to a Chinese emperor, 11th century, who from his throne, carried by his subjects, asked them to clear and destroy trees and plants around to create that necessary distance in the gaze and thus enjoy nature. Therefore, let us not forget that the pleasure of the landscape contains from its beginnings, the environment of waste and destruction of our environment. For the upper classes, it is a delight to clear the field because that way they can control the limits of their domains with their gaze, as well as enjoy human dominion over nature. Nature seems natural only because it continues to advance without stopping like the undead, and because we keep our distance from it, frame it and evaluate it, Timothy Morton. We, I mean, I, I just, I mean, you will find a lot of Timothy Morton uh, quotes here in this text. I will continue. Violence in and around the environment is profoundly warped up with the properties of that which is exploited. The green content of the political mobilization that may be either a cause of or a consequence of violence in variability ends up taking on a number of other colors and hues. Is the myth, the mythic, magic and the national properties of oil, its wealth, its value, its magical powers to transform, coupled with this subterranean territorial nature that seem to, evaluate, to, to elevate petroviolence to the point where profound question of a state, nation and citizens are posed by it and where structural, structural violence is perpetrated in its name. 
development as progress is a perverse return. Timothy Morton. The manner in which the mythic, magical, and biophysical properties of oil enter into these violent struggles, how oil is talked about, framed, and given meaning, is ultimately an empirical question, which is to say one needs to examine carefully the historical and cultural local context of oil. Oil's liquid and subterranean properties and the fact that it is in many respects invisible, flowing through pipelines or being burned as gas, contribute to the popular understanding of petroleum as socially polluting, magical, and all-powerful. Oil is invariably attached to debates over the legitimate source and use of wealth, and not surprisingly, its power to tarnish and turn everything into shit. Oil is the devil, shudder shit, Nicolás Maduro. As you can see in these pictures, there are like uh, two, two pictures. This one, for example, is like a two spears that the Tarahumanani uh, people they like they 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 like to put it you know put them you know in in different trails that they they are in the Amazon rainforest, and this one which is really symbolical is another from the Tarahumanani another spear, and this is how you know they look with them you know how they use them is is really symbolic. Let's continue. In this sense, oil as a resource to make something from, to take something from Walter Benjamin become, becomes a sort of Swiss image. In, the, in nature, the new is mythic because its potential is not yet, yet realized. In consciousness, the old is, is mythic because its power were never fulfilled. Paradoxically, collective imagination mobili mobilizes its power for a revol revolutionary break from the recent path past by evoking a cultural memory reservoir of myths and utopian symbols from, more, from a more distant past. This collective wish images are nothing else but this. It is so rare to find an honest and scrupulous man in the oil business that we might as well consider him a museum piece. Harold Ike's US Secretary of the Interior. Interior. Like other forms of domination, the introduction of capitalism was accompanied by missionaries, supreme and expert dealers in images and signs. From the beginning, the oil companies, the missionaries, and the military worked together in what could be called a complex petro-military model in which the objective is to extract the greatest amount of crude oil at the lowest cost and in the shortest possible time while looking for new resources, new deposits to exploit and deplete them. The oil companies in Ecuador offered their transports to racial saint of Sil so that she could complete her reduction and pacification work as soon as possible. The Rockefeller humanitarian organizations subsidized SIL for years. Their intimate collaboration sought to detach the Huarani from their independence to implant in them material dependence, but also spiritual dependence. So as you can see here in this picture, there is a uh, Rachael, I mean, Rachel Chang, like uh, speaking through the radio. Usually they used to record some uh, messages, uh, like uh, to, to have contact first uh, through sound, you know, with an airplane. The, you know, uh, from the sky and telling them like uh, to be peaceful and all this stuff. After some years, the people, for the Waran people, they are using the same medium, the radio, just to, you know, from know to each other, I mean, from different kind of communities spread in the, in the rainforest. What is SIL? Yeah, w what is that? Okay, it's like a, a la international language uh, Christian organization. You know, they are trying to, to, to make every community which is not Christian, uh, to try to Christianize, Christianize them, you know, mostly. But they are using it, I mean, uh, they are using language to do that. So, for example, with Warani people, the, what they did is like a, mostly to uh, start uh, knowing better their language and then to make this, this kind of messages to the rest of the communities of the Warani people to convince them to come here to have a better life, I mean, uh, because of God and all the stuff like that. But it's like uh, the Rockefeller uh, family is, is, is behind them, you know. I mean, it's, it's quite, this is another story. I mean, you, we, can, we can follow another path if we continue talking about them, you know, like uh, how 
the Christianity uh, use these kind of tools and what happened there. Let's, let's continue a little bit with them. Christianity made possible the exploitation of nature, creating an, an indifferent towards the feeling of natural objects. The Christian vision of nature replaced the equality of all creatures, making possible the unlimited domination of man over creation. They destroyed pagan animism. They knew the new colonialism will achieve that neither the force nor the persuasive strategies of conquerors or and missionaries could achieve that the irreducible savage are conquered so that they learn to, to live like a Western in peace. This pacification was used as a tool for submission. The West is not in the West. It is a project, not a place. Glissant. The joint work between the missionaries, the state and the companies allowed the implantation of the infrastructure of Christian civilization, the legal and military administration, as well as opening the ways to inaugurate the de definitive massive colonization. Religious organizations provided support to the authority of the state, alleviating the tense situation generated and imposed by the state itself. In other words, they found in the soul the balm for the wounded body. Literally. The voice of conscience opened the way the, to ultimate pacification and subsequent submission. This is where the integrity of the community is based in the physical process with confrontations, repression, and projections, as well as in, in the geological, ideological processes for, the, for defense against a project threat. This is the central regulatory, regulatory mechanism for colonial discourse, as Peter Hume well points out, a perceptual, a perceptual circle that allows repression by contract. In all displacement, something is lost along the way. War is a multi-dimensional displacement, Timothy Morton. Um, like other colonialism, capital also had a cultural project, installing imported meanings and practices about time, space, self, and work. From the beginning, there has been a change of mentality of the Ecuadorian state in relation to the Orient, and therefore a public manipulation of the national sentiment of the, of the space based on oil interests and the state. The Orient was constituted in an inhospitable space abandoned by the state and consequently by the national society. It was later when they obtained the first barrel of oil that nationalist sentiments were generated, consolidating a national identity in what was before no man's land. The production and celebration of national symbols and sanctuaries, as well as a figuration of the majority other became a central process in the establishment of the na nation state. There are no more objects anymore, but relationships, possibilities. Oil gained this extraordinary emotions and hopes. S since oil is about all the great temptation, this is the temptation of peace, wealth, fortune, power, but oil through powerful has its defects. This is the first barrel of oil by, that they get from the Amazon rainforest in the, in the Ecuadorian. They, they took like a, I mean, helicopter or something like that. Or, I mean, they, they, they took like, a, like this, as you can see. But now, I mean, these two pictures are really funny together because they are looking for the Taramenani people in the rainforest. Meanwhile, they were taking the oil first, like many years ago. So I put a little bit of data here, just numbers. So I will, I will skip that part. The projection of the land as the last possible conquest conquest through military control. The military are responsible for the security of the present in a dynamical relational space, and they become the saviors of the nature. While the religious function as a spiritual avenues for the alienation of the excluded through supernatural hope and appeasing goodness, the supported freedom within a non-state and a self-regulating -regul capitalist system makes the perfect condition of possibility of one's own faith turn into the everything is possible. This colonization process, parallel to the expansion of oil activities, shaped a kind of logical territorial ordering. Space is uh, deterritorialized and commodified according to the ethnocentric neoliberal capitalist reason. The determination of the space demarcates, limits, excludes, observes, control, controls, does not allow access to the interior. These are the perfect conditions for extraction activity. Protected place create 
fraudulent images. They degrade our reserve of information. They are impossible places. The Edenic place is a cheap imitation, the product of a society on the move, which produces not only space junk, but also junk spaces. This is really nice. I mean, I don't know if you know that, that movie, but uh, I suggest you to, to have a look. It's nice to think how it works, uh, you know, like uh, the sound itself, you know, music, how it's peaceful for our ears, especially when it's really strange and we never listen to that sound, to that doesn't matter, you know, that voice, for example. Uh, let's continue here. Capitalism can recycle waste and not everything is segregation, separation and progressive social marginalization. Hence, environmental degradation manifests itself as a symptom of a crisis of, civiliz of civilization marked by the model of modernity governed by the predominance of the development of technological reason over the organization of nature. The focus on economy of, on economic and national development issues has eclipsed environmental and human rights concerns. The ecological approach takes as its central principle, the relationship between a uh, perceiver and its environment. What interests extractive capital and political power are the techniques and mechanisms of exclusion, the surveillance apparatus that have been set up there and that now constitute an essential element of individual, individuals and their spaces. The establishment of intangibility, the non-existence of contact, indigenous surveillance devices, the self-determination of peoples, insofar as they improve the functioning of capitalist production. In other words, in the words of Foucault, the modes of action more or less thought and calculated, destined to structure the possible field of action of the others, marked by an extreme imbalance of power, lack of contact as the greatest form of tact. If the old right of sovereignty consisted of killing or letting live, the new right will be that of letting live or letting die. The state as a structural machine of control through the organization of a space and the care of daily discipline. The state represents itself as an invisible, invisible entity in the region. So the delegation of its function to the oil companies has generated a sui generis from, the, from all of oil management. Oil companies policies can be diverse as the population and communities are. This is no a state policy that regulates community relations, which makes environmental and social management in the region conflicted. A non-state, the absence of a state, is a sovereign state of violence. The peoples without contact are the unrecognizable and irreconcilable alterity with the identity of the state. This people, these peoples need to be trained to comply with the values imposed and recognized as essential for social reproduction. Control is more effective on anomalous or deviant behaviors from the norm. No categorization of indigenous peoples is absolute. 
except perhaps the one that refers to control. The control, manipulation, and representation of the past, the history of overexposed peoples. Power, power is, is, is above all uh, relationship of forces. And in the analysis of exercise of power, it's necessary to, the, to locate the separated spaces, distances from the center. Power against power. In all forms of domination, the problem is in knowing where the resistance will develop. The question of resistance exists precisely where power is, where domination, violence, and therefore suffering are built. Counter power is config um, configured as an opposition to these great techniques of power in a space that is constructed as an altered power from non homogenizing perspectives. They have come out of the shadow and silence. They have become a subject within a confessional modern state, a state that listens. Power is that enigmatic, unknown, unknownable, and invisible thing, present and hidden, immersion everywhere. From an omnipresent scientific knowledge supported by reason, and which claims to be objective and universal, the other is always a stigma, a deviation, or a pathology. Knowledge would thus represent a strategy of appropriation and domination. These researcher subject relationships are found in many post colonial situations. As esculcate, cult, esculcate science and logos is the objectification of the traps of power. I mean, I, I like a lot, in fact, that, that word, you know, auscultate. I mean, we can talk about that a lot. I mean, it's like, a, it's like a when we listen to our own body. I mean, you know, auscultate is, that, is what the doctors do, you know, uh, you know, to listen to our body. So it's like a, we should listen to ourselves. That's the exercise for today. But this is, we, we should listen to the science and the logos also. The environmental problem is the effect produced by formal, instrumental, and economic rationality as the form of knowledge, and it and it it's, its will to dominate, control effectively, and economize the world. Um, I think, therefore, I am offers a carte blanche for dominance and possession through Western science, technology, and reason in conquering the universe. The Cartesian domain erects the objective violence of science in a strategy well regulated by the state itself. The absence of the state requires reconquest. The state is God, vigilant of sin, omnipresent in its invisibility, a whole holy war against nature itself shown as a new ecology. We need more dark ecology without nature. The general principle of ecology is to believe that properties of perpetual objects must be significant simply because they cannot, they can be shown to be there by a measuring device. The birth of monsters is the hypervigilant vision, the lesson getting. Meaning coexist with nonsense, it shadows one thing is overshadowed by another because it's overshadowed by itself. Distinguish thought from nonsense is like a taking a lie, taking, taking a lie from out of its habitat. All coexistence is like language, a virus. For there to be, a, to be meaning, language must be loud, chaotic, imprecise, grainy, and elusive. These places have their own limits that are tagged, tracked by birds who demarcate the borders morphologically, but the sound knows no borders, nor, nor limits, but dynamic and relational places, not monumental. The straight lines do not delimit the landscape and the birds know it. Analytical precision for limits on listening is not feasible. The fact that they are sounds and not drawn lines should not deceive us. Borders are, and limits are established in many respects, not only by the physical marks left on the stone or earth. The landscape of what was once an impregnable jungle and, and musicalized by the sound of the species succumbs to the sound of the, of the machines. It is generally assumed that the environmental refers to the quality of water, air, and soil resources, as well as aspects related to the human environment, noise, radiation, epidemics, etc. While the ecological refers to those aspects related to the nat natural environment, natural areas, renewable natural resources, biodiversity, among others. In the administrative sphere of the Ministry of the Environment, 
the environment has been associated with names such as environmental quality and the ecological with green or natural capital. The fact that they are diffuse damage, even future or referred, the difficulty of determining the agent subject and consequently the problems that appear in relation to the causal link makes subjective responsibility inapplicable. Listening seems to leave the world, the world intact. It leaves no marks. Listening is a conductor of inner devastation. The valuation of deteriorated environmental assets and their respective economic quantification must include, in addition to the patrimonial losses, all the social, collective, sociological, cultural, psychological cost, costs. This is an economic epistemological analysis of the damage to the ecosystem that allows quantification from a social projection and not merely individual or business. The reparatory duty encompasses the figure of consequential damage and lost profits, but also the concept of moral damage must be considered, which consists of pain, anguish, physical and spiritual affliction, and in general, the suffering inflicted on the victim by the harmful event. event. Apocalyptic movements share with deep ecology a fundamental lack of interest in the unfolding of events. Since the end of the world is near, or since we will all become extinct in the long run, Worrying about it doesn't make much sense. Um, his vision of outer space does not prevent Tibetans from conceiving ideas about compassion and nonviolence, as well as having an amazing restorative justice system, Timothy Morton. As a factor of the failure of the ecological market is the non-existence of a specific market for environmental goods because the human foundation for the preservation of the environment lies in future generations, which are societies that do not currently exist, but which are certain to inhabit the planet. The presence of the different culture is essential to create and guarantee new possibilities. Sabian civilization is Sabian a people. Any easy to think ethic is a failure. To exist is to coexist in an interconnection, implies distance and difference. The more environmentally conscious we are, the more we experience the darkness. The history of life forms is like a book. Many pages are missing, which we intuit thanks to the few that remain. When we're aware of the catastrophe, which uh, we will realize that there was no nature, no ontological ground. This is, a, this is war from the point of view of vulnerability and otherness. This is to be aware that we are responsible for the other forever. In words of Emmanuel, ecological thinking in, in Timothy Morton's words needs to develop an ethical attitude that we might call coexistence. Or in Darwin's words, existence is adaptation and not harmony. The intellect can, cannot bear radical difference, mortality, and finitude. We live in a culture of death, although our mind does not know how to recognize it out of our knowledge. Let us remember that knowledge implies suffering and life is not the opposite of death. There is not a final resting place. The model is always an overflow of the known. Life is an ambiguous spectrum on death that is a steward between two types of death. Um, yeah, <laughs> the machination of the death. Yeah, sorry, go for it. Uh, the, machina uh, the machination of the death uh, de drive and the dissolution of physical objects, Morton. Let us accept that all beings disappear or are transformed. No culture lasts forever. Decadence and death are normal, natural, they enhance life. They're part of it and thus make it up. The prolonged and invisible disappearance of a place or a culture, like the moan of a death, leaves a scar, an invisible mark on the landscape. There are those who think that the Waorani house is inspired by the cosmic conception of the universe. The sound of wood breaking is like the sound of thunder. The quality is what prevails in the noises of the wall over the sound, because in things there is no otherness. The function of Thunderous bursting and the rupture may, however, prevail over aesthetics and quality. The bell is an instrument to produce a sound in resonant functions, a split the continuously world of light as a call from beyond. The sound as a wall describes the structure 
of a wall in, in which the other can appear. Curiously, the Guarani tend to set fire to the houses after leaving them to find a new location in the jungle. The reason in all its tactile rawness spins out in the eight technologies of otherness. Curiosity, noise, cruelty, appetite, skin, nomadism, contamination, and dwelling. These technologies stand in a way on their own and yet are not fully resolved in and of themselves. The other is semantically encoded as a site on which anxieties about loss of control and boundary distinctions are projected and thus the other is always connected with death. The darkness of ecology thinks the truth of death, an enormous cognitive relief that if integrated into the social form will embody nonviolence. If we want the nonviolent coexistence of all beings, we shall think about what attitudes promote that reality. Radical otherness is feminine subjectivity, whose sense is about passivity. Listening of the ethereal is an example of this. Codependency is the coexistence of passivity with passivity. Listening to each other in silence, from and with desire, leaving nihilism aside. The statement that there is nothing supposes the presence of at least one other being that hears it. The only possible ecological idealism is coexistence in the strangeness of the familiar. When you experience beauty in your inner, in your inner space, you have hints that there is at least one thing that is not you. My own solidity depends on my condition of being diffuse, blur, with respect to others. There are no limits. The relationship with the other has to, has to do with a seductive relationship with myself for others. Desire circulates, produce things, induce pleasure, forms knowledge, produce discourses. This is the relational power of objects, a productive network that runs through the entire social body. It is no longer a question of seducing the other to kill him as in pre-modern societies or colonialism. Now is a question of producing him, of turning the other into an object of passion. The myth of the other as the exotic is perpetuated by the mechanism of its appropriation as an object, the art as a commodity object of admiration and contemplation. This contemplation that requires distance, like the landscapes, regardless of desire, arises from the, from the need to create the other as an, as an other, as the different, as the stranger, to later incorporate into a single social system without difference in the culture of domination. When the other becomes an exchangeable object, commodity, then I am the one who wants the production of submission through seduction. I submit myself in radical familiarity with other beings, taking a new path for coexistence. My existence involves you. My listening includes you. There is no solution without dissolution. Coexistence is not an option. It is a condition. To exist is always to exist doubtly. The, the others are the expression of choice and freedom. When the right not to choose is included, we will all overcome. We will be dissolved when you when you get to know a stranger the strangerness disappears to be a person is to worry about the possibility of not being a person yeah so mostly is just that i mean the the that text that i i mean that it is like a kind of uh, thanks, Sarah, for your reading. <laughs> I know it's not easy to read this kind of text, uh, but mostly it's about that, how it works, I mean, the context of foil, because it's really important. And I mean, if you understand about any people like the ego and the Taramenane, I mean, what happened with the other? Mostly it was just about that. So, I mean, I can, I can go deeper into them, even I have more text, but uh, that's that's the trick, let's say. That was my proposal for today. Like I try, try to under, to talk more to talk more about oil uh, with these two characters, with these two communities. Um, that's it. I don't know if there is any kind of question of there is any uh, people alive there or not <laughs> sleeping. Well, uh, Mikkel, I'm, I mean, I'm a little bit aware of time and that we uh, aim for the event to come to close in about 10 minutes. But um, 
in some ways, I was quite interested uh, what is what has not come into this talk, perhaps because of time or something, um, has been the sound work that this project revolved around. Is it, would it be possible to listen to a short excerpt from some of the sound work that you made? Uh, um, and perhaps that could be, a, you know, people might have questions or, or basis okay. around that. Do you mean like a dark sound? Hmm. Yeah, okay, let's go for it. Okay, uh, I know it was short, it was just one minute, but uh, in fact, I mean, uh, yeah, in fact, in the book, there are like a, it's like a, also like a, like a trip from the natural recordings uh, into the mechanical recordings that you can find it there from the oil extraction. Uh, the idea is just, for example, for us, when we are in the rainforest, uh, any kind of natural sound, uh, becomes like a threat, you know? I mean, it's really like a, I don't know, it's, it's really quite something. So how we listen to them, maybe probably from home, you know, uh, from a safe place, is quite different, the feeling of, of them. But if you ask to the people who has been in their Amazon rainforest, they will tell you that. During the night, for example, it's, it's, it's really, I don't know, it's, it's, it's quite something to listen to these kind of sounds because you don't know, you don't know from, from where they come from. And from them, from these communities, like the Taromenane, for example, these mechanical sounds like a, for us could be more, let's say, musical. For them, it's just directly noise, you know? It's like a kind of exchange from the natural and the mechanical, trying to, you know, to make this kind of exercise in the, uh, in the limit of, of where is me and where is the other. And, uh, and that's it, and that's it. Mostly what you will find in the book, in, in these recordings, uh, mostly it will be something like that. And as we have a few minutes left, I mean, is there anybody who would like to ask a question or has a particular comment that they'd like to put forward? Everybody's sleeping. <laughs> I think that um, I can see some faces. Yeah, I can see some faces. Because for me, I mean, I think I know this. There's the question in um, Ecuador with around, around drilling oil. But it's like I think the question of responsibility mm -hmm. is a kind of interesting one, where like. Mm -hmm. You know that uh, a country like Ecuador can see other countries around the world making billions of dollars from an industry that is pervasive throughout the entire of society. You know, it produces the main producer of energy in the world. It's in plastics, it's silicon, so many different projects. Um, and you can absolutely understand that. Well, well, we want a piece of this too. You know, and then uh, the rest of the world says. But you can't do this. And science, you know, it's so important for global health. And even, um, as I said, with the point where the, at one point, the Ecuadorian prime minister put forward, well, if you pay us not to do the drilling, we won't drill, but otherwise we're going to drill. 
and the world community didn't step up and, and come forward with that in the developed world. So I think there's questions of responsibility and then ethics of how the oil industry behaves. But um, I suppose from your experiences, do you have any opinion about like where those responsibilities lie? Mm, yeah, good question. Uh, I would say that, I mean, the name of that, that, that this text is like a, is like a all, all law. Um, I mean, it's a Latin word expression from a kind of uh, calling responsibilities of uh, the damage that, that you, we can make to someone, let's say, you know, doesn't matter which kind of damage, if it's an object, a place, or even moral, or whatever, you know. So the responsibility in oil, by my point of view, as uh, it says in the text, is mostly, for example, how we can deal with these communities that, uh, like at Aromenane, they don't want to have any contact with us. I mean, it's mm -hmm. okay. how we can deal with them while they are, you know, on top of a big, big, big place, you know, I mean, full of oil. Mm -hmm. And if the Ecuadorian government, they, they will not drill the oil from them now, probably because, you know, like a, they're like a big, big, I mean, balls of oil, you know, and uh, probably the Peru, Peruvian government, which is in the south, they will take it, the same oil, because it's, it's quite connected. So how it works, the responsibility, my, my point of view, even for us as like, a, I don't know, as consumers, I will say like a, to leave the space as it is. I mean, as, I mean, in nature, I, I think I will say like as much as we are conservative is better because if there are some people like uh, them, like uh, that it's so clear that they don't want to have nothing to do with us. I mean, they don't want to listen to us. They just want to live as they have been living from the beginning of the times, even before Colón, you know, went there. So we shouldn't, we shouldn't take that oil from that, from, from that place. And in, I don't know, in, in Norway, for example, as much as I know, uh, they are taking the oil, you know, from the from the sea. Even if we don't see that, as we can, as I mean, as Michel Foucault likes to say, like uh, this kind of hidden actions, like uh, they are not showing. It, I mean, showing to us that they are drilling the oil from the sea. We cannot see that usually, but they are doing that, so they can do whatever they want. Eh? And, uh, but what happened, I mean, let's understand that, for example, when they are, we are taking the oil in the sea, what happened with the fishes and all the species that they are living there, that they are not humans. Do they have rights? But it's not a matter of, it's a matter of law. It's, it's a matter of, I mean, accumulation. This is just capitalism. I mean, we want more oil to accumulate more capital. That's all. That's the idea. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of kind of equilibrium as they do. You know, this kind of communities like the Romenane with the, with the, I mean, with the jungle. You know, they are taking only the things that, that they can eat. They don't take more. They don't. They are not accumulating nothing at all. That's the idea of the capitalism mm, is making us like a, just to accumulate more oil and more money. And this is what is going on in, in Norway and everywhere. So we should think about that more, like uh, if I need that or not. I mean, as individuals and as a society also, like uh, if we should, I don't know, drill, drill, I mean, take out this oil or not, if we need it or not. I mean, for Norway, it's, it's, it's quite obvious that probably, I don't know, I don't know if they need it, in fact, but they are doing it, of course, because we are, in that system, we cannot avoid that. So how to do that with responsibility? I don't know. I don't have any answer for that. I guess no one, nobody has that answer, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, have to, I thought it was a very interesting proposal from Ecuador that, well, okay, we won't do this if a global community wants to, you know, financially cover the money that we will, we're going to lose by not doing it. And mm -hmm. uh, interesting that you know it, it wasn't you know it wasn't taken up that challenge you know. 
So, and I mean, uh, the, we're running out of time now, but there are lots of other questions around responsibility within the oil industry and who actually makes money and where the money goes and all that side of capital with it, as well as, as you're saying, kind of, yeah, the responsibility of how you work in a place of, mm. you know, uh, absolutely precarious environmental um, mm. health and situation, as well as sociological or cultural interventions. But um, yeah, because we're at 7.30, I will wrap up and say thank you very much, uh, Mikael, for taking us through uh, and introducing it to work. Um, thank you everyone who joined us as well. Uh, I hope it was interesting. And um, yeah, hopefully, we say the next event is on the 9th of September um, at three o'clock European time because we have uh, Anair Lockwood who will be in New York at the time, New York State, and um, Leah Barkley who will be in Queensland, Australia. So we're going to be really dealing with three global <laughs> time zones uh, with us being in Oslo. So yeah, those of you who can join us, it would be lovely to see you again there. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Sarah, for the reading. And um, thank you, everybody, and also to you, Lasse, and to you, Nicola. Thank you. Thank you, Mika. Yeah, and thanks everyone for their kind words in the um, in the chat as well. And very interesting to see where people were coming from. Quite a quite a range of places.